So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Adriana Vallejo and I will be your host for this demo day that we're taking a part of uh, the third forum for the development, uh, the technological uh, development and uh, entrepreneurship of medical devices uh, for LATAM. Uh, and we are going to present six startups uh, that are going to take uh, their pitches today. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit about them. Uh, but before we start, uh, we would like to tell you that all of these uh, startups are in a TRL six or, or more. Um, there are um, projects from Latin America that already has their, uh, their own uh, intellectual property uh, registration. And they are uh, right now doing or willing to uh, go to international uh, markets. So the, this is really, really important for us to, for, uh, to be here. And we are going to have, uh, well, six startups. It's Indy, Ingeniería and uh, y Desarrollo, Unima, Hera Diagnostics, uh, Gese Biomedical, Machina In, and CardioTac. And, and uh, for the uh, side of the VCs, we are going to have six, uh, seven, sorry, uh, seven VCs that are going to uh, review all these startups. And they are going to, uh, they are from different uh, countries uh, around Latin America and also in the United States. Our lab, Artifacts Angels, Black Sheep, Cygnus, Gain, Redwood, and Sherman and Sterling. Welcome to uh, all of you, uh, and it's great to have you here uh, for, for this demo day. Uh, to start the event, we are going to uh, start first with Jesus Ulises Tamez from Indy, which is going to present, uh, who is going to present uh, their pitch. So welcome, uh, Jesus. Uh, can you open um, your- Yeah, thing? oh there, okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. So I'll share my screen. Is that fine? Yeah. So, uh, so, so just wait a minute uh, before sure. everyone starts. Uh, we're going to pitch for five minutes, and then we are going to have five minutes for the uh, VCs to uh, ask some questions. So you can start now. Okay, you can see my screen, right? Yes. All right. Okay. So thanks a lot, everyone, for your time and your attention and this opportunity. And so, uh, first of all, I want to repeat uh, my, the name of our company is Indy. That's a short name. We're a company which started in, uh, in Mexico, in Latin America, and now it's based in France, in the south of France, in Marseille. And uh, so, well, what I'm going to be presenting as part of what our company mainly does is what we, what we call Indy exoskeletons. So a lot of you might have heard of exoskeletons. They are robots, basically machines that are, way, that are worn on top of the body, on top of the existing limbs to support, uh, well, to support the strength and motion. And uh, there's many uses for them, but we focus on the rehabilitation sector, on the health sector. And, uh, and our goal is with exoskeletons to bring rehabilitation closer to people. That's the main goal of our devices. Uh, so basically the idea is that exoskeletons, I suppose i think many of you have already heard about them you've seen them in videos and you've seen them uh, being developed in different countries uh, but uh, all most of them have a common they have a common denominator that they're based on for adults uh, there's a lot based on the industry there's some for rehabilitation but they all sort of lack the the ability to get to the latin american market and also to the to the children's market uh, so that's what we focus on. We focus on making it uh, an accessible solution for Latin America, uh, considering all of the practical implications that that means, and on making sure that it that it supports children mainly, because we believe that early rehabilitation and early support is key to improve the rest of, of, of their lives, of the lives of patients. So that's that's what our model, which is called ALICE, focuses on. This is. This is the main model that we're that we're developing and promoting right now. So the key, the three key factors of our exoskeletons and the technology that we that we developed are optimized mechanics, robust PID controllers, and customizable designs. 
So this means uh, customized uh, mechanics means that we focus on making the design from from the mechanical side, even from from the basic, uh, let's say most well mechanical and constructing manufacturing side, make it easy, um, make it easy to construct, make it easy to to assemble, make it easy to repair, and uh, all of those things are part of the practical implications that I mentioned about making it accessible for the Latin American market. Uh, the the second part of PID controllers means that even though we are using accessible components, accessible mechanics, accessible accessible uh, electronics, sensors, controllers, all of the different components that go into a robot, because they are more accessible, that also means that they are less uh, sophisticated, less robust. So that means that our algorithms need to be more robust. They need to be able to compensate for for the lack. Of, uh, of sophistication that, that these components have. So, so that's what we focus on, using cheaper materials, using cheaper components, and compensating with our, with our controllers, with our program, with our software. And then the third part is that, as, as I was saying, we focus on uh, children, exoskeletons, exoskeletons for the legs, as you can see. Uh, so that means for children who cannot walk, so that they can do the rehabilitation process and walk. But we also offer uh, different customization options. So that means, if there's a clinic, because we focus on clinics mainly at the moment, that needs a specific solution because they want to focus on the right leg or on the arm or whatever, we can also do this. So mainly we're working with a pediatric exoskeletons for legs, but the technology that we have and the expertise that we has, have allow us to cover different types of exoskeletons depending on the needs of clinics as well. Um, now focusing on this exoskeleton in particular, Alice, as I mentioned, the functions that it has are, are these six that are shown on the left. So it can help the patient go from a sitting position to a standing position, to walk, uh, and then to sit again. So this is mainly the most common rehabilitation uh, process that is followed. And, but we can also do different exercises like extending and bending the knee while sitting down or also while standing up. And, uh, and the, the gait or the walk uh, process is divided into four steps as it's shown on the bottom. And we can also help the, the child learn the walking process. And it's, it's key to get, to, to get the patient to understand how the exoskeleton works as well. So these are the main functions that it has. Um, this exoskeleton has already been uh, trialed and tested and used with patients uh, around the world. In, in Mexico, we've, uh, we've already put it in a, in a in a clinic, which is only for research, so for research purposes. All of this is in the research area at the moment. It's not certified for rehabilitation, but we can use it for research purposes under a specific clinical protocol. And, um, and it has been used with patients uh, with these characteristics shown here. Um, we, we focus on allowing ambulation, which is different from many of the rehabilitation exoskeletons that exist right now. And uh, these are some of the, of the competitive advantages that our exoskeleton has. And, uh, and so right now, the, uh, I already mentioned some of, the, some of the advantages that it has, but it's about portability, accessibility, and uh, being able to be used in Latin America with its practical implications. And also uh, what we're focusing in is on allowing connection with BCI systems so that we can do more, uh, more thorough rehabilitation. Uh, I think I'm running out of time, so I'm trying to go fast. Is that, uh, that fine? So anyway, uh, right now we're focusing on implementing the exoskeleton on more uh, parts of the world. We're moving towards Asia and doing uh, clinical trials in, in, uh, in Europe and Asia as well. But uh, we're also getting into more and more clinics in Latin America using this research, uh, research uh, framework, let's say. And uh, this is a little bit more about what we're doing and where. And uh, well, a little bit about our team, and I guess that covers the main the main part. So if you can, if you want to get go, to, if you want me to go more in detail, you can go ahead and ask. Uh, we can go through the questions and answers. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have a question from Rodrigo. Thank you, guys. Uh, Jesus, congrats. Thank you. Um, why? Why going to the market of kids and not going to grown-ups? Uh, I, I mean, I think there will be like a huge market. Elderly people will use it like like super easy and will be super fast to introduce it. Well, there is actually a practical implication uh, which uh, which makes us focus on children uh, as well. So there's two parts. 
one of them we thought it, it was significant to start with children uh, because of the emotional factor, factor. It was important for us. But also, actually, there's a, there's a factor of uh, actuators. So it's actually a practical implication. Actuators, so the motors that actually make the exoskeleton work, uh, the more force we need them to exert, the more expensive they are, right? Okay. So right now, to achieve our price range, we have to focus on smaller bodies, let's say. So uh, if, we wanna, if we wanna focus on larger bodies, larger people, you know, adults who are also heavier, we have to jump to a different type of actuators and that also raises the price kind of significantly. So we're talking about at least five times. So, uh, so that's what has stopped us right now. We have worked with adults, we are working on that. But that's mainly why we wanted to start with a low price range. So that's also why we focus on, on children as well. Got it. Understood. Um, are you raising money now? Uh, yes, yes. Basically, we're, we're looking to expand the, uh, the application of our exoskeletons in more clinics in Latin America. As I said, right now, there's two that, that, that have and are using it at the moment. So yes, we need uh, money to launch it and make it grow faster. Thank Can you. you tell us the, the, okay. uh, the, the, um, how much are you raising and, and that will be it? Well, you know, I, right now I don't have a specific uh, sum. We, the funds and the, the numbers that we're looking at are in the, in the range of hundreds, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. to allow for rapid expansion. But there, I don't have a specific number. I would like to start from that range and then discuss more specifics. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Marco, you have a question? Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Adriana. Uh, congratulations again, uh, Jesus. Uh, I have a, my questions are more related to the commercial strategy. So from what I understand, your, your customer is going to be the rehab uh, clinics, right? Yeah. Uh, how big is that market? And uh, what kind of a strategy are you going to follow for the commercialization of, of the product? Mm -hmm. so, so the most important thing is that for sure, there are more people who need the device than the clinics, right? This is, this is for sure. However, the, the difficulty or the obstacle that we found is that, especially in Latin America, uh, people who most need it don't have a lot of money to buy one for themselves, right? So we, we explored that area. We've been working on this for, for, for about 70 years now. So we've explored a lot of different uh, lines. So we explored that area, but we found that probably the, the economic, let's say, barrier would be too high. So that's why we moved to clinics. Now, what we, what we look at is at allowing the, the clinic to buy or rent a device, because we also want to keep upgrading it and giving it maintenance. So it can be a purchase or a, or a rent uh, system. And then what we, and, and this is similar to what other exoskeletons do also around the world. What, what we do is that we allow them to give service and charge for that service, but it's much cheaper than, you know, for a person who needs it, it's much cheaper to pay for a rehabilitation session in a clinical center than to buy an exoskeleton. And then basically with the money that the rehabilitation center is making, which is, which is less than a person would need to, to purchase it, then they can buy or rent the system from us. So that's basically the, the strategy, put it in the hands of the clinics, so that they can provide the service for a charge, which is, uh, I hope, not too high and accessible for most people. And that's how we make money as well. So what is the, in, in that line of thought, what is the cost of making each of these devices, their sell price? And do you have the, the financial strategy behind it for a, for a leasing model, if you need to develop these devices and put them into a lease? So right now, right now we're selling, we have been selling the devices for a, an average of 15,000 euro, 15,000 euro each. Uh, and uh, well, all of the ones that we have, I mean, uh, so far it, it's been just like a, a, basically like an investment or sales, let's say a uh, model. We haven't, the, the renting, uh, let's say strategy or line is a proposal. It, it, it's something that we haven't actually implemented. So uh, it's something that we still have to explore and sort of shape. We know it's, it's a good idea. We haven't gone too much into detail in it. OK, thank, thank you, you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you for both. Uh, well, we are going to follow now uh, with UNIMA, uh, with Jose Luis Nuño. Uh, Hello. Yes, I'm just going to share my screen now. Thank you. 
Whenever okay, you want, it should you be can able start. to see my screen. Okay, perfect. Um, something's happening. It's um, okay. There it is. Well, hello everyone. I'm Jose Luis Nuno. I'm CEO and founder of Unima. The problem we are solving is the centralization of lab testing, which limits the access to attendee diagnostic for billions. Current technology for diagnostics is very precise and can detect almost any disease known. But the problem is these require labs with expensive equipment and specialized technicians, making lab testing impossible to scale up to provide universal and timely access to diagnostics for everyone. A recent example of this will be, for example, the lack of testing capacity of current lab infrastructure to cope with the surges of COVID testing demand during the peak of the pandemic, even in developed countries. So to solve this problem, we developed PIND. PIND is a rapid testing technology platform for real-time diagnostics, which allows anyone to diagnose a disease directly where it's needed without using lab equipment with results in around five to 10 minutes or less and at a very low cost. With FINE, we can provide access to, the, to a diagnostic, even in the more remote areas of the world. So we are actually decentralized rapid testing across industries by developing fast and low cost diagnostic tests for large scale real-time disease detection, which can be used even in the more remote areas of the world. Our mission is to take diagnostics out of the lab to the place they are needed the most to secure a timely diagnostic for everyone anywhere. Our technology platform, Find, uses three elements. The first one is the wetware. We're using shark antibodies modified with genetic engineering to detect disease biomarkers in blood, saliva, urine, or water samples. These shark antibodies are used in a microfluidic car where these get in contact with the patient sample and generate a visual reaction when they find the specific biomarker of the disease that we are targeting. So um, then to evaluate the result of the test, you take a picture of the testing card with our Explora smartphone app, which runs an image analysis process in an artificial intelligence algorithm to give you the result of the test. And these results are in, along with contextual information like geolocation, date and time is sent to a cloud server where we can use it for real-time disease uh, tracking or to provide better information to our customers to control diseases. So with this platform, we have been able to develop very to use tests in, for example, just four steps that can be used by anyone and be deployed even in the more remote areas of the world. Now, the business model that we follow is called Diagnostic Platform as a Service. This is something new. What we do is we work with large customers like healthcare organizations, pharmaceutical or agri-food companies, and we develop tests tailored to their specific needs from the disease they're looking for to the data use they are going to be for using the results of the test they are getting. So we go from design to manufacturing, delivering the test ready to be used on large scale to these kind of customers. Right now, our first two products in commercial phase are a test for tuberculosis developed to screen patients with suspected tuberculosis in endemic countries mostly. This test has already received approvals in Mexico and Indonesia and is in approval process for CE marking I will be launched in the third quarter of this year. Our COVID uh, test detects the virus in saliva samples, and it was designed to be used at home, school, or at the workplace. This test has received approval in the European Union and is in approval process by the FDA in Mexico. This product was initially launched in the first quarter of this year. To date, we have a contract to deploy our tuberculosis test in, starting in the first quarter of next year in Indonesia, where the product has already been approved by the local medical device authority. Also, we just closed uh, just a couple of weeks ago, a new contract to deploy this test in African countries starting next quarter in Rwanda. Additionally, we are developing a test for a confidential application with SET, the largest women's hygiene company in the world to deploy in early 2023. And we are in the evaluation phase for a new test for sexually transmitted disease with a global NGO focus on women's health. We are a second time founder team. Together in our previous startup, we developed a pharmaceutical product to increase vaccination efficiency in animal health. And we launched this product in 14 countries in partnership with the German pharmaceutical company, Beringer Ingelheim. Um, so we have proven experience taking products from the lab to the global market. And we have also been supported by Y Combinator, Stanford Startex, Endeavor, and Mass Challenge. We have investors from the United States, the United Kingdom, and Latin America. 
And we have also received grant funding from the governments of Canada, Google, the government of Mexico and Germany, and the International Bank for Development. To date, we have raised uh, now $3 million, including a $750,000 extension to our seed round that we are closing this week. And we plan to start fundraising again a 10 million Series A round in the late second quarter of next year, with the milestone of selling at least 10 million tests per year by the end of 2024, to launch at least one new test per quarter between 2023 and 2024, and to become cash flow positive by 2023. So in UNIMA, we have a very clear mission to secure a timely diagnostic for everyone anywhere. So that will be on my side. If there's any question, I will be happy to answer. Thank you, Jose Luis. Uh, we have any question? Any, anyone wants to open their mics? Yeah, thank, thank you, Adrian. I would like to, to, to have a question. Hi, Jose Luis, good to see you again, long time. Um, so the contracts that you mentioned in Indonesia and in Africa are those already secure? Is that is that a fact that you will start uh, uh, selling those those products by by the end of this year, basically? Or, yes, no, sorry, twenty twenty three, right? Uh, yeah, that, for example, in Indonesia, both of the contracts are are ready, are signed already. We are moving to start deploying. In Indonesia, for example, the only thing that we're waiting for is to be included on the government list for um, for the time. Now, this is this is something like in Mexico, so you need to be approved by the government to provide this for clinical hospitals around the country. So what we just we're waiting is for finish uh, validation that we are running with University of Indonesia there. So we are expecting that at least by early 2023, we should be already open and in the system and to start selling to clinics around the country. Uh, in, the, in the case of Africa, this is a contract that was closed and signed a few weeks ago. Uh, the product was already presented in the national, well, in the international conference in Africa that gathers all the Commonwealth companies, all, all the common, Commonwealth countries in Africa. And right now, we are start working with Rwanda, with the military of Rwanda. So the, the military has asked for a start of validation there in order to start going the product maybe in the next two months or so. And this will push also the Ministry of Health to start using the test. Also, for example, the military can start buying the product even without registration, while the MOH will need a previous registration. But also like this, we already have the answer from Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya, Botswana, Uganda, Congo, and I'm forgetting one country, sorry. So this is something that is executing. So I'm pretty sure that before the end of this year, we should be already be selling in a couple of countries and then going to the major country, which is the Indonesian one. Thank you very much, Jose Luis. Thank you. Any other question? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Adriana. Hi, Jose Luis. Congrats for the, the project. I have a, a question. What is your you vision in the next five years? Because uh, the market of the diagnostic test is, is huge, but you need a, a lot of million of dollars for lambs mm -hmm. this product in different country. What is your vision in the next year? Yeah, first, we are going to focus on certain areas where we know there is very big unmet needs and very big opportunities. For example, women's health, sexually transmitted diseases, um, cancer, etc. We are going to focus also in very high transmissible diseases, including the coronaviruses, having influenza, RSV, etc. And we are also going to uh, to enter the track of agriculture, which is animal health and um, crop health. These are applications where, the, let's say, aside from infectious diseases, which there is more, much more competition there. But for example, agriculture and women's health are very a very big markets with not that much competition. So there's big opportunities to enter and have very, very interesting market share very quickly. And because we are working the other way around, so we first get the customer and then we develop the test up around their needs. We have the customer ready to reuse the product by the end of the development process. So instead of us, for example, deciding which way we are going, 
we know in which segment we are going to target uh, these users and we are working with them to define what specific challenge that they want. For example, with this NGO, the idea is to work in sexually transmitted diseases as a first step because this is one of the most, let's say, on their service activities they have because women have this tendency of, of being shy of being tested for this because of the social pressure that's over this. So there are certain applications where our technology fits perfectly. And we are going to target this first and then try to span around. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose Luis. Is, uh, we're going to follow with the next startup. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, all. Have a great Thank day. you very much. Now we're going to present Hera Diagnostics with Teo Tijerina. Do I share my screen? Yeah. Okay, hold on. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Can you see me? No. Yeah. Well, uh, my, my face. There you go. Okay, now we can, <laughs> now we can see you. Okay, uh, I will uh, try to make this not too painful for everyone. Uh, fantastic presentations, by the way, to all the people presenting. Um, we are Hera Diagnostics, uh, Innovations for Life. Um, a little bit of a company profile. We are a U.S. Delaware corporation. 50% uh, of the founders are USA, 50% are Mexican. 38% of the founders' shares are owned by women. Uh, we are in the middle of a $3 million seed equity round. Our Series A, at minimum, is going to be $15 million, possibly $20 million. Um, our mission is to save lives by delivering uh, revolutionary disease diagnostic screening to the global community. This is a little bit of a quick timeline on our first application, which I'll, I'll get into a little bit, but I'll give you an idea of where we've been and where, and where we're going. Um, so we acquired uh, the, the first part of the IP uh, from a prior startup named Onco Solutions. Uh, uh, we finished it up August 2021. We were able to close some angel investments uh, from uh, GAIN, uh, Guadalajara Angels, uh, Roger Banford, uh, Sharon Duong, Encore Health, um, making some, we made some, some design uh, device enhancements, um, uh, got started with all of our planning, detailed business planning for our seed round. And we launched our seed round officially March 1st. Of 2022, uh, we're aiming to close 3 million uh, seed equity by October 2022. And um, by November, we finished some device training uh, to make a slight improvement on the accuracy before we go to market. We are going to market in Mexico first. By February 23rd, uh, 2023, we expect to get the final regulatory approval on our sleeve. And then we hope to start selling. We do have an LOI in process with the Secretary of Health in Mexico. We should have that in a few weeks uh, in more of a, in a more um, what, uh, legal framework uh, and then move towards a contract with them. Uh, so we expect to start selling March 2023, uh, business to government and then to the private sector in Mexico. And then the private sector in Ecuador will launch uh, by June uh, 2023. Uh, the first application we're tackling is uh, cervical cancer. Um, the current screening methods uh, have very poor accuracy. Their visual inspection in the developing world in particular, their visual inspection methods or the traditional pap smear has very poor accuracy. The, the screening is painful. It's uncomfortable during the procedure plus women report cramping, spotting, bleeding. Uh, there's, it's emotionally exhausting. Women also report a lot of anxiety waiting for the results. Um, and then there's elevated treatment costs because the results are not real time. You have to wait weeks, days, or months. In the case of rural women, uh, you have to, uh, sometimes you can't even go back to give them a result. You can't find them, so it becomes very problematic. So our solution is this medical device uh, that comes with a disposable sleeve. Uh, it provides a real-time uh, diagnostic uh, with improved accuracy over the traditional pap smear. Uh, it reduces cost as well. Uh, it's very accessible, it's more comfortable, and it's portable. 
um, well, let me go back. Uh, hold on. Basically, how it works, uh, it uses two principles. It uses opto electrical spectroscopy. Um, we take tissue measurements with different frequencies of light, and we take um, voltage. Uh, we do slight voltages, uh, and we measure resistant changes in tissue. Uh, and then from these principles and in artificial intelligence, we can determine with pretty good accuracy the existence of a cancer lesion. Um, the device is a recurring revenue product. We sell one device, but we keep selling sleeves to the practitioners. We estimate our customer acquisition cost to be around $1,100, but the lifetime value of around $21,000 and the lifetime uh, gross margin, these are Mexico numbers, around 16,000 um, for each device we sell. There's 8 million pap smears a year in Mexico alone, so it's quite a big market. We are going to be targeting 10 countries, uh, starting in Mexico, expanding immediately to South, six countries in South America, US, China, and India. These countries represent about a $3 billion opportunity. Uh, in terms of social impact, if we're able to elevate the particularly the developing countries to best practices, we anticipate that we'll be saving around 90,000 lives per year. Uh, we are aiming with the cervical cancer market alone because our device is also, we're also doing a proof of concept with skin cancer here real, really soon. Just the cervical cancer market alone in these 10 markets will be a $100 million company with very strong uh, EBITDA. We are playing in the intersection of artificial intelligence, oncology, and women's health, which uh, is currently trading at about 25 times EBITDA. So it's a very lucrative opportunity. Again, uh, seed round is a $3 million equity seed round. We currently have about 750,000 existing convertible notes, including the discount and the interest. We've got about 100,000 in commitments that are coming in in the next 30 days. Uh, and we're looking for another 1 million and a quarter to reach the $3 million. Uh, these are our angel investors, Encore Health from Monterrey, Roger Bamford from Palo Alto, and then Guadalajara Angels from Guadalajara, who's, I think they're on this call, and we're very happy. Uh, this is the executive team, um, technical team on the right, uh, and then the commercial team on the left. And then these are some of our key opinion leaders, medical and business advisors uh, that are helping promote uh, our product to the medical community that are helping us guide us with our strategy. Uh, we're super enthusiastic and that's pretty much it. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Theo. And uh, now we are open for questions, please. Is there any question from Isis? Uh, No, I, I don't. I don't have any questions. I know Theo. We know Hera. We've talked to him before, so I would mm -hmm. like to probably catch up with you, Theo. Uh, oh, absolutely, tonight, yes. Because uh, it, it's been a while since we last uh, talked, so uh, that there's looks like there's a lot of a lot of progress, and uh, uh, so congratulations for for that. No, yes, you too. We'd love to chat, Jesus, Delaney, and I can hop on a call and uh, catch up with you guys. So thank you so much. We're also sure. very enthusiastic about the work you're doing. So. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, there is not uh, any any other question. Well, thank you very much, though. Uh, we are going to uh, go now with uh, Ramses Galas from Hesse Biomedical. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Um, all right. So, just a second. All right, so the project that I'm, a, I'm gonna discuss right now is very similar to the previous one. Uh, so it's basically the same type of device. However, this is completely disposable. Uh, so it's also for the same purpose of doing the cell sampling uh, of you know, past beer devices. And uh, we have developed this device uh, back in 2015. Uh, we submitted a patent. We already have the patent. We, uh, it has been issued by the uh, Mexican uh, um, IP uh, office at IMPI, 
So, but uh, GSC Biomedical is a medical device development firm, and we have over 36 different patents. We have four regulatory approvals. We have uh, two FDA clear devices, and we have uh, two uh, COVID-3 uh, clear devices, one of them being, uh, you know, mechanical ventilator that we did during the COVID crisis. So it was one of the uh, few, the three approved uh, uh, devices uh, in, in, in Mexico for, for as a class three device. So uh, I'm just going to reshare some of the information that Del Tijerina was already mentioning. I mean, like 59 million women in Latin America do not do the, you know, their pap smear test for, you know, and this is to prevent cervical cancer and sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, but, uh, and they don't do it because of shame or fear or, or cultural factors or ignorance or, or there's a lack of uh, prevention culture in, in, in Latin American countries. So therefore that is our, our, our market. I mean, like we want to be able to uh, give women the ability to self-perform the, you know, the, the pap smear test currently, as Dale was mentioning, you know, it's painful. Uh, there's shame, there's anxiety because there's, you know, it requires that uh, the woman has to go to a clinic and they have to perform the test in, in a clinic and then there's a doctor there, there's a technician, uh, there's light, there's, uh, there's uh, sheets and, and, and women have to be, uh, be uh, undressed for this test. So there's a lot of things that are not uh, suitable for, you know, performing the test. Uh, nevertheless, most of the cost in develop, you know, in performing these type of tests are logistic costs because they have to bring all this infrastructure and equipment to the patient, not vice versa. So in this case, what we're trying to do is we want to uh, give only the sampling device to the patient. We're not changing the way the study is being performed. This is still compatible with liquid-based uh, cytology. This is still compatible with HPV uh, detection. So we're not changing the, the, the way we are doing the, uh, the diagnostics. We are just changing the way we're sampling. Uh, uh, the patients. So this is a this is it. This is a very simple device. It costs about two point two dollars to produce one. This is completely disposable. Uh, it could be sterilized, ETO, gamma. Uh, it it doesn't really uh, affect it. Uh, we've done some preliminary testing so far. The milestones uh, that we have done. I'm going to skip to that slide. Uh, we've raised about two hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of grant money. Uh, and recently, we are partnering with Canada, with uh, Genome Canada and McGill University, the Department of Gynecology at McGill University, because they uh, developed a method to, to detect, uh, you know, cervical cancer, ovarian cancer, and endometrial cancer uh, using uh, genomics. So they were recently awarded $6 million uh, from Genome Canada to actually, uh, you know, fine tune the development of the screening test. So, so we already have a patent, we submitted a, a PCT. Uh, we are in the process of continue, continuously improving the design of the device. So we now have some IP that we're about to submit uh, this year because we have found through the test and through the help of Genome Canada that some of the sampling can be greatly, greatly improved by changing the specimen collector. And we already know how to do that. So we're about to start that. But for the current device that I just show you, uh, we've developed a, a, a preliminary clinical study in which we have 86% adequacy for screening uh, uh, cells, you know, for, for liquid-based cytology and for traditional cytology, which is the current standard of care in Mexico and Latin American countries. Uh, there's no other standard of care other than liquid-based cytology or traditional cytology for, for detection of cervical cancer screening. And, and we also know that because we ran preliminary tests also well, with HPV uh, testing with 97% sensitivity compared to traditional methods. So this is a very good device for um, detecting uh, you know, cervical cancer as well as HPV in the same sample. So we're not changing, as I said, we're not changing the way things are being uh, tested right now, but we're just changing the way that uh, we're sampling uh, the population, which is, as I said, it's a cultural problem. It's a problem of cost logistics, and we're just changing the way we do it so that we can actually increase the number of patients that can actually have access to this type of, uh, of, uh, of uh, testing. As I said, this is part of my team. It's not the whole team, but uh, in part of our resume is that we have 36 uh, different patents in the cl in class one, class two, class three devices. We do anything from uh, intensive care devices to uh, uh, orthopedics to uh, endovascular devices. So we got a lot of experience in, in you know, developing these things. And again, four regulatory approvals. 
this is just a you know a, a sample of a business a, you know a small business model that you know we could sell the device for 200 pesos which is about ten dollars as i said it, it has a cost of about 2.2 dollars .2. so the actual cost for the government to perform one of these tests is about 250 to 350 pesos which is about 17 or 18 dollars something like that and and that and the target population in mexico it's about 18 million women in the in the public sector, but about 10 million in the in the private sector. So this is you know a 28 million uh, target population. If we just penetrate one percent of the market, we would have annual sales of uh, about 2.8 million dollars. Considering you know the uh, the cost of developing you know producing the device, it would be a profit of about 78 percent. And and sorry, the cost also includes the logistic cost of distribution. Uh, this is just a, a screenshot, you know, but because this was recent, this was back in 2020. So we are partnering with McGill University to actually uh, improve the device so that we can have uh, the same uh, genomic uh, testing uh, method uh, match with our device because we are also developing an endometrial and ovarian cancer device as we speak. It's not yet finished, but we're uh, we're using also part of these funds to uh, to come up with a better device. So this is. This is it. So um, thank you very much, uh, Ramses. Yes. Yeah, uh, Marco, you have a question. Uh, congratulations, Ramses. Uh, you. you mentioned that that you're basically changing just the sampling pr process, yes. not the not the diagnostic. Who does or how does the diagnostic is executed? Any government lab, any private lab, they already have PCR machines for HPV detection. They already have microscopes for uh, liquid-based cytology. Uh, so it's, it's just any regular lab. Uh, the, the thing is, what we're aiming for is that we want to provide women the ability to self-perform the test so that they can, so they actually want to do it in, in the sense that, because there's a lack of uh, coverage in the sense that women don't want to go to a gynecologist. They, they are afraid, they, they have fear, they have shame. Uh, they don't know why they, they, they need to do it. So instead of bringing the patient to the clinic, we're bringing the device to the patient and she can self perform the test. By the way, the, the results that I discussed about uh, a little a little ago, uh, they were performed entirely self uh, made. We did not give any instructions whatsoever to the patient. I mean, they, they knew they had to insert the device, but we didn't give any specific instructions to the patients on how to perform the test. So that, that was a very uh, uh, a good thing because we, based on that, we were able to have 86% adequacy on cytology tests and 97% uh, sensitivity on, on HPV testing by self-performing the test without any instructions uh, given whatsoever. Now, uh, regarding the, the cost that you mentioned, the 200 pesos, does that include the usage of that laboratory to do the uh, no. PCR? Testing? No, no, but but those costs are are minimal. That would be about fifty pesos, you know, just for the diagnostic mass diagnostics. Yeah, I think that's something that you would need to consider in your some somehow in your business model and take care of that uh, logistic for for in order to be uh, successful. And I believe that based on your projections, having two million dollars uh, EBITDA uh, from a two point six million dollar revenue. I think uh, it's it's overstating the efficiencies because there's going to be a lot of marketing that you will have to do to position yourself as a viable uh, solution right. for 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 this uh, population. Yes, yes, I agree. Thank you, Marco. Julio. Thank Thanks, Adriana. Congratulations, Francis. I have a, a question. I, I don't understand if you have already compliance in confer in confer for this product. No, the part of the funding that we're requiring is to actually do uh, this the regulatory filing for a class okay. two device in both Mexico and the United States. So, okay. so part of the one point two million dollars that we are actually raising, uh, about four hundred thousand dollars is destined to do the regulatory filing and, and regulatory compliance and you know testing, which includes biocompatibility of all the materials. Uh, you know, the ISO 13485 GMP, uh, uh, you know, validation, sterilization, validation, everything, uh, that's that's going to be a cost of about $400,000. Okay. Do you have a plan how much time you need to compliance this, this, for this product? Or the, the, like the end, it's, it's in two phases because the engineering for the device that I showed you, it's completely ready. We can actually go to market with this device. Okay. Uh, however, we do need to do the regulatory stuff. Uh, we need to produce the final molds. We need to produce. We need to do it under GMP environments, and that's going to be about nine to nine months to one year. Okay, that that's one thing. 
But as I said uh, during the presentation, we also partnered with uh, you know, the Department of Gynecology at McGill University, and they were recently awarded $6 million to develop a, an ovarian and endometrial uh, cancer screening test using genomics, which has a 99% sensitivity rate. Using genomics, it's a different method. So for that, it's gonna take us about two or three years to get to the point where we can be commercially available. Okay. So it's, it's, it's kind of like two different projects. Okay, thanks. Thank you for both. Um, okay, if there is not uh, any other question, we're going to follow now with Antonio Ruiz from TOSI Health. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. And can you see my screen? No, we cannot see it here. Yes, we can see your screen. Hello, I'm Antonio Ruiz, CEO of Tosi Health. We believe we sh uh, the world should be pain free and health professionals and consumers should be get advantage of highly effective use of friendly products like by the latest advance in science. That's why we created Tosi Health. Pain is a global health problem. One in five people in the world suffer from chronic pain. Just in USA, it is represent more than 50 million adults living with this condition, making pain the main cause of living with disability in North America. That's why we developed TOSI, a smart portable blood therapy system that provides a highly effective pain relief therapy session anywhere. TOSI helps reduce inflammation and pain in muscles and joints with this patented technology. That uh, brings together the two best proven therapies in clinic trials, near infrared light that penetrates deeper into the skin and heat in the optimal therapeutic window that guarantees results. This highly efficient therapy is packed by a portable, safe, ergonomic, and easy to use device that can be used in any part of the body and any place, home, office, studio, or gym. Safety is the most important feature in our device because the most reported adverse events of commercial heat impact are burns from, from overexposure on people uh, falling asleep during the therapy. But one of the most important feature is the smart expert system, which is the controller that will allow to device, uh, the device to communicate from the distance and gather data from each therapy uh, given. We have designed a sticker in collaboration with TM and Marianne that you can use to place the pad in the localized pain area, ensuring maximum fixation and heat transfer. We confirm we have a big market as the global pain management device segment was valued at $5.5 billion dollars in 2019, with a nine annual growth, special, specifically in the US for main market, our target could be more than $700 million. And we believe we can reach at least 5% uh, at least of market share, which means 38 million in revenue uh, only for the first year. We will sell a, as a direct to consumer medical device, price around $300, with a growth margin from the first year uh, for 60%, growing to 75%, while we can reach higher production unit levels. We have two main channels B2B2C, to to medical equipment distributors and wholesalers, and B2C through our e commerce website. TOSI has the efficiency of a pain therapy given up by a professional, which can cost $68 each, but you can have a multiple times at home for all the family members. Consider our intended to use, pay, or it means pain relief. We compete with this spectrum of products and technologies, but our benefits and characteristics sur surpass by far the ones offered by them. Currently, we have few patents in the most important markets, 
USA, Europe, China, and Mexico. Our regulatory part is very clear, and we have been classified as a class two medical device with, with 510K exempt, meaning that we do not require pre-market clearance from the FDA. All we have to do is establish a quality management system from the, for the company, follow good manufacturing processes, register the company with the FDA, and establish uh, our US representative. Right now is the right moment to support us as we have reached very important milestones. We have proof of concept where users, users, doctors, and distributors have given a positive feedback. We have patent peel for our main markets. We have a working prototype ready for production. We have a clear regulatory pathway with no need to pre-market approval from the FDA. And finally, we have currently working in our PMS. We are a strong multidisciplinary team that successfully combines business experience with science, engineering, and bioelectronics and medtech capabilities. Our, uh, our advisor have broad experience in development, manufacturing, and commercialization of medical device in US and Europe, and strong intellectual property expertise needed for this type of product. Currently, we are raising $500,000 to achieve our next milestones and estimate an exit for our investor by acquisition or buyout, delivering at least uh, 15 value uh, 15x value for the money. We have received uh, multiple honors and awards recently selected as a mass challenge finalist for LATAM acceleration program, health innovation award in 2019, and the first place in healthcare projects for the technological innovation fund CONACYT in 2019, and selected by the United States Mexico Science Foundation as beneficiaries of the patent support program. I want to thank you everyone for your interest in TOSI and I'm open for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. Is there any question for him? Any questions? Sorry. Hi, Antonio. Uh, I would like to ask out of the 500K, do you, how many, uh, how much have you received commitments and do you have a lead investor already? Yes, we have a grant, uh, some grant uh, uh, prices uh, from uh, Conacyt, and we have nowadays some angel investors, uh, more about uh, at least one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Perfect. Okay. Marco, any other question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, ten, 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 oh, I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead, Julio. No, no, no. Sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Ah, thanks. Uh, hi, Antonio. Congratulations. Uh, I have a question. Uh, do you have any other reference for other device to have a, a success in the in the market launch? Or no? Yes, we, we have uh, some uh, great examples of uh, uh, novels uh, devices. But that devices doesn't mix the, uh, both uh, technology, heat uh, uh, and red infrared light. So uh, in the first steps of this commercialization, uh, they, they are uh, successful, but uh, is, there is a not uh, direct reference because we have two technologies in one, only one device, and that device is uh, totally portable and comfortable and it's not a reference against the, 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 um, the competition. But uh, for example, both of them have reached a, a Indiegogo or Kickstarter crowdfunding launching uh, campaign and both reach at least one and a half, and a half a million dollar for pre-sales only in two months. Thanks. Okay, and how about the question, why are you looking for an exit in five years? Uh, why not looking for next uh, round, maybe B or C? I don't know. Yes, we, we have a, 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 a next seed valuation in two, in yeah. two months. We will uh, reach uh, at least one and a five uh, 
point uh, million dollars in order to uh, finance the manufacturer uh, supply chain and distribution. But we know that uh, uh, more than five years is the average term of an exit in this uh, sector. So we believe that will be uh, in at least five years. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for both. Uh, thank you, Antonio, for you. your presentation. Now we're going to uh, follow with uh, Daniel Hernandez from CardioTrack. Hello. Nice Hello, to meet you all. I'm going to share my screen. Perfect. Just one second. I think you already see it? Yeah. Perfect. So um, I'm Daniel Hernandez, and I'm going to talk to you about CardioTrack, a company that is transforming healthcare accessibility in Latin America. So as you may know, um, from all the workforce in Latin America, more than 30% uh, of them has a chronic disease, at least one of them. And most of the persons that uh, has a chronic disease are unaware of their condition. More than half make uh, out-of-pocket medical expenses and 80% uh, of all this population with chronic diseases can be prevented or controlled with early detection, monitoring, and treatment. We also know that absenteeism is a high cost for companies reaching uh, up to $300 million per year due to employee absenteeism. And this number goes up with persons with chronic diseases. We can, uh, um, you can also lose productivity up to 40%, uh, depending on what kind of uh, treatment uh, if the person is controlled. Uh, but um, it's also, um, the problem is worse because of uh, the overcrowded government medical service due to lack of infrastructure and the model of work in Latin America. So we noticed this and we begin uh, making a lot of measurements uh, in several companies. And we produce uh, this uh, service where we, uh, as a, an agnostic, a device agnostic company, a SaaS company, we made an integration of any kind of device that is uh, Canada Health approved, uh, FDA approved or Coffee Priest approved. We made an integration with a web app application uh, that has a proprietary profile generator so we can make uh, have traceability of the worker, uh, whatever they are. If they change uh, of company, we have a device in there. We can keep getting the person in, in control. And we made, um, we apply a proprietary algorithm to identify the persons with hypertension. Then uh, we invited them to a follow-up program in, uh, through, via WhatsApp with a multidisciplinary team uh, that has a health coach, a medic to uh, confirm the diagnose, a nutritionist and a psychologist. So we can make like a 360 assessment of the patient. We uh, can deliver the, the prescription um, remotely and deliver the treatment in the workplace. So we can make sure that the patient is taking their medication and is controlled. And this way we can make an improvement in the um, health of the patients, of, of the workers and uh, the productivity of the company. We also uh, make uh, a lot of effort um, attending the company because in Mexico and also in a lot of countries in, in Latin America, that's why we focus in Latin America, we have a lot of compliance where the, the employers has to make these kind of measurements in the, in the uh, workers that has uh, high risk jobs. So we deliver um, push notifications of the patients who doesn't meet great criteria. So we don't expose, expose them to high risk jobs that can um, uh, finish with the uh, death of a worker, something like that. Uh, we deliver health status reports and a health gradient follow-up so the company can be sure that uh, the workforce is healthier to time with our program. So we can uh, deliver these kind of benefits for the employers, the improvement of quality of life by early detection, prevention of chronic disease, uh, a convenient, simple, and accessible service for workers. Um, for normally they, they have to uh, make commute like for four hours or something like that. We can deliver the treatment. They can be in touch with a, a complete uh, a professional health service uh, through WhatsApp. So it's uh, pretty practical for them and a personal tracking support of their physical and mental health with this uh, uh, team. 
Uh, and, and for companies, as I was saying, the low compliance is very important. They already have to do these kind of measurements. So we can uh, add value to this process than where normally they discard all this information and they can have uh, evidence of the increase of productivity by lowering the employee absences. So right now, we are, we are reaching uh, half a million measurements uh, with 23,000 engaged patients. We are closing this year with uh, half a million uh, dollars in sales since 20, uh, the ending of 2020. And we surpassed the 100% of growth for, from 2020 to 2021. And we have a 0% churn rate. And we're working with uh, more than 16 companies, most of them Fortune 500. That's because um, the uh, expertise that we have in the, in the business, in the occupational health business, and uh, the entry market that we already have with other companies uh, in the past. The team, uh, we are three co-founders. It's, it's El Alvarez in sales. We are expecting to uh, expand in Latin America uh, in the beginning of next year. Eduardo Serna, our CEO, with uh, more than 50 uh, years, 15 years of uh, experience in the Mexican healthcare industry market. And he already has uh, had an exit in another healthcare uh, occupational health company in the millions, millions of dollars. And myself, uh, I'm a doctor. I'm a specialist in occupational health, and I'm um, I'm the uh, medical director of Cardiotrack. So this is us. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, are there any questions, please? Yes, when you when you say that there's a law compliance that companies must abide with, what 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 are you talking about? Is that in in the U.S. Is that in Mexico or in Mexico? We we have all the operations in Mexico right now. There's a, a normal standard. It's called uh, a Norma Oficial Mexicana. It's called in Mexico, where they have to make uh, these kind of measurements, pressure, uh, uh, equilibrium, and some of uh, some others. Uh, in person that has to do a high risk jobs, like working in a forklift and in confined spaces, and they already have to do it. So uh, we begin doing these kind of measurements, like 400 uh, measurements per day, and they use doctors and nurses doing this kind of measurements. So we uh, automated this, this process, and we are, um, begin taking advantage of all this information to begin to diagnose this kind of uh, these patients uh, with hypertension. We already diagnosed uh, three thousand uh, workers, and yeah, that's that's the main um, the main issue. And we have uh, this kind of low compliance uh, requirements in a lot of countries in, in Latin America, like Peru, Chile, Colombia, uh, Brazil. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other question? I think I, I think Rodrigo had raised his hand, but if not, I have another another question myself. Um, of course, when you talk about 20, 23,000 patients, how many companies are those? And I assume that the company is your customer, right? You you sell yes. to the companies, and they provide this to as a as a benefit to the to the patients. Yes, the company is the client; is the one uh, who's paying for this uh, service. And these twenty three thousand patients are from sixteen clients. Perfect. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome, Marco. Adriana, just uh, wait for Rodrigo. He's yeah. in, the, in this list. We are going to invite you, invite him as a, as a panelist. Just one second, Rodrigo, please. Or if you can write, okay, here, already here. Perfect. Thank Rodrigo. you so much, guys. Um, a couple of questions. Uh, congratulations on the results. Um, there is a lot of data that you guys are using. So my question will be in that sense. Do you guys have anyone of the, of the team, uh, that scientist guy or anyone who can make the data uh, useful? On, on the other hand, uh, this is kind of um, like important thing to deal with this personal information. So how do you guys deal with it and, and uh, achieve this uh, these uh, normas de información pri este, privada and that kind of Confi thing. Confidentiality. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the specific data from one patient, it's only delivered to this patient. Uh, uh, and we normally deliver statistics to the company. So uh, the general health status, 
like the gradient that, that uh, I was talking about. Uh, so we we have the um, the necessity to 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 uh, deliver uh, when a patient is not uh, fit to work, when the patient has like uh, 180 uh, um, of systolic blood pressure. We have to advise that the person is not fit to work, but we don't deliver the uh, number of, of the measurement. So that way uh, we can help them to comply with the government, with the um, normal standards, and uh, we don't share any kind of personal information. The personal information, uh, the clinical personal information is only shared with uh, the clinical services in the company. As you may know, uh, a lot of companies here in Mexico has like uh, their, their own clinic uh, actually, or their, their, their own medical service, and they can uh, have access in this kind of, to this kind of information. But uh, to EHS or uh, um, the management, we only deliver the uh, general status of the company, how many uh, hypertensive person they have and how many are controlled. Uh, and for the uh, uh, expertise part in science, uh, we uh, are looking for an, an, an advisor or even a partner with this kind of, of background. We already find one and we're uh, defining what kind of uh, uh, collaboration we are going to have with him. Uh, it's, uh, he's from the United States and he will be um, adding up to the team. Got it, thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Daniel, uh, for your presentation. Uh, well, with this, we uh, finished our uh, demo day for today. Uh, thanks uh, for, to the six startups and the seven PCs that uh, just for, uh, were part of this event. Uh, it is great to have you here and uh, great to see how uh, well the, the startups in, in medical devices are, are growing every time here in, in our region. So we're not going, now we're going to turn to spend